Yeah, let me set the scene. Um, so I was born in Washington, D.C., actually in D.C., so not from a state. Um, <laughs> and I was just a huge reader growing up, like the kind of kid who I think really Belle from Beauty and the Beast was my role model. And so <laughs> I was always like walking around reading books uh, imagining that everybody else was like, wow, look at that little reader go. Um, <laughs> and yeah, got, got really into performing and theater as well. Um, when I was growing up and I, I think the two of those really work together in tandem because they're all about stories, right? So I've always just been fascinated by stories. What, what, um, what were you drawn to as a kid? What were you reading? What, what, what couldn't you put down? Oh my God. Okay. My favorite book was Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine. Did you ever read that one? I, I never read it, but I, I know the story. It, know the story. Yeah. Fantastic. For those who don't know, it's like a little Cinderella retelling where the reason that she's so obedient is that she's been cursed by a fairy, it's that she has to be obedient. Um, and I just remember thinking it was so thrilling to have this heroine who was like funny and spunky um and but she still got to have like a really great love story that made me swoon all over the place so i you know i read that book probably uh, 10 times mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i loved that one of course i loved the classics of you know charlotte's web and little women and then i remember in high school in english class uh being assigned white teeth by zadie smith and having this moment of like oh Novels for adults can be like this. They right. can be so right. creative and wide ranging and modern and cool. <laughs> um, so that was another big one for me. Yeah, it's funny. Like you mentioned high school novels. It's like, I think they could either, you know, make you or break you because I remember reading mm. some books in high school and maybe it was like middle school, but I remember reading like Catcher in the Rye for the first time. I'm like, wow, this is a great book. Like I want to hang out with like Holden Caulfield. And then I remember reading some other books, like, I just want to slip my wrist and it's a slog to get through it, you know? It's like, yeah. I don't know if it was like the force that, like, you were forced to read it and forced to, like, overly analyze it. But I always thought that there was something about having to analyze it that I just didn't love. As a kid, anyway, as a kid, like, as an adult, I like to dig in, but... Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny then that you grew up to have a podcast where you talk to authors about their books. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I agree. I think I was always very self-conscious back in high school. And so I, I didn't really like talking about books because I was like, what if my opinions just suck? Right. <laughs> and I, I read the book wrong. But now, like, yeah, I would love to be in a book club. I guess I am in a book club. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, now you're, you're COVID, you know, it's all weird. But you're also the topic of book clubs, which uh, I'm sure will be, you know, interesting. It's very cool. I have been able to zoom into some over the course of the year. Uh, I guess, you know, one <laughs> good thing about the past year is that people are doing more Zoom book clubs. And so it's really easy for an author to pop on in. And um, so I do a, a great thing where I will come on for like 15 minutes and they can ask me their questions and they can say all the nice things <laughs> and then I leave and then they can like talk about their full opinions about the book. Right. They, they can rip you apart. Not that they would, but afterwards. Yeah. But so, so, you, so you were always like drawn to, you know, drawn to the arts. I mean, drawn to reading, drawn to stories. Um, when, when did you, when did you get a sense that you could make a living out of it? Or when did you get the sense that you wanted to make a living out of it versus whatever else you may have wanted to do when you were a kid? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess as a kid, I had sort of very fleeting interests in other things, like one week where I thought maybe I wanted to be an astronaut. But mostly I always just wanted to be a performer or occasionally a writer. But then it it really moved over to the performing side. And so after college, I moved to New York and I was auditioning um, for a lot of musical theater and getting some fun stuff. But also that lifestyle just involves so much waiting. Um, you know, you go and you sing your little piece and then you like check your email frantically for weeks and weeks to see if <laughs> they want to cast you. Uh, and so I was probably 23, 24 doing that and also working a bunch of random day jobs that weren't particularly fulfilling to me. Um, and so I thought to myself, well, why don't I try just as a hobby? Why don't I 
get back into writing, a thing that I hadn't really done probably since high school. Um, and so I, I started and realized that I really loved it. And then I got good feedback on my writing from, you know, other friends of mine who, some of whom just were voracious readers, some of whom, uh, were starting to work in the publishing world. And that was the moment where I thought to myself, oh, wow, maybe it, this could be a potential career. And then it took me, you know, years and years to actually make it into a career. Right. Um, and I had many moments along the way where I thought, nope, you need to give up. Um, but now it is, which is wonderful. Well, I, I, I want to talk about some of those moments because, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this are aspiring authors themselves. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about um, some of those moments that, you know, maybe were a little bit darker or maybe, were, you know, you're questioning your abilities, um, kind of just talk, talk about a few of those if you can. Yeah, for sure. So I don't know if you know this. I wrote a novel called The Summertime Girls that came out in 2015. Uh, it was like a really small printing. And I got really lucky. That was my first novel that I had ever written. It was sort of right on the border between young adult and adult mm -hmm. fiction. And so it came out and I was so excited. I was like, this is going to change my life, even though, you know, it was a tiny advance. Um, there was no publicity for it. Uh, and then it didn't change my life. And I had been working on this other book that I was going to bring out to editors. And I was like, I already got Summertime Girls published. I'm going to, you know, you just go up and up and up, right? That's how it works. Like each book is one more rung on the ladder. Um, and I knew that the new book was better. Uh, and then it just got rejected from everywhere we took it. And the editors were basically like, we think you're a good writer and we like the book, but we just don't think we're going to be able to sell it um and like your last book didn't sell well right. so right. sorry uh so that was a really dark moment you know i was like i poured my heart into this book and nobody wants it. it's the best thing i'll ever write um and then i kind of almost started writing happy and you know it my next book out of spite i was like they want something that'll sell i'll write something commercial <laughs> um <laughs> and my original plan was to uh you know write happy and you know it and sell happy and you know it and then be like now you must publish my other book <laughs> that i love so much <laughs> but then then i went back to it you know a couple years later and was like oh actually i've grown as a writer <laughs> <laughs> what well, did, you, did you, i can do better did you go back and reread it and, and realize hey th these other people weren't necessarily crazy that there was some issues with it or yeah yeah or you know i i still thought it was a good book in many ways but I was like yeah I get why people thought it wouldn't sell I could probably write this better now if I tried yeah <laughs> so yeah but you know I, um I'm, go, I'm, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry go ahead oh no I was just gonna say that while I was writing happy and you know it you know that was like a year and a half two years of working on that and you know feeling like the time was just slipping away and I didn't know if anybody was going to want to buy it. And it was scary. It was a scary time because I was like, this is my plan. Right. What if it doesn't work? <laughs> what, what else were you doing artistically during that time? I mean, were you doing, because I know you, you also do some um, you know, videos, um, you know, and I know you've done some acting as well, but what else is going on during this period of time in your life when, you know, before when, I'm sorry, before, you know, Happy and You Know It comes out, um, you're still working on that. What else, what else is kind of fueling you at this time? What else are you doing? Yeah. So creatively, um, and you know, in my arts world, I was doing the occasional play. I remember like the most fun one was I got to go off and be in a regional production of the importance of being earnest for like three months. And that was such a delight, you know? Um, and my friend Dominique and I formed this comedy duo and we were, um, like writing funny songs that we would put online and make music videos for. And some of them did quite well, actually. But um, it, it never ultimately, like, became a career. Um, and then for my day job, I was doing some writing for various websites. And then the big thing was that I was singing to babies. Like, I was a children's birthday party musician. <laughs> <laughs> and I taught like little baby music classes during the week. <laughs> and so that's, I mean, that must have really been, because I was curious to know like where the idea for Happy and You Know It came about. But 
it seems like you were living, not that you lived the entire story, but you have some good source material there. (laughs) Yeah, I was interacting with a lot of the women who were bringing their babies to the class and I just kept being like, what's going on in their lives? I kind of want to be friends with them. What if I was? What if I got in too deep with some of them? And that's where the plot of that book came from. That's funny. I mean, I have I have three kids. They're um, we, we have triplets, um, but and they're wow. ni- they're nineteen now, so we're way past you know the the you know that stage. But I just remember going to so many birthday parties where you'd have the children's musician, and I was like thinking the exact opposite of you. I'm like, I want to know what's going through this person's head as they're performing for the kids and for us, and and all the BS that they probably have to deal with. Um, oh my God! What 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 was it like, kind of making you know, having that be like a source of income for you? I mean, I'm just I I have to know. Sometimes, uh, okay, to start out with, sometimes it was wonderful. Um, like when the kids were adorable and they were into what you were doing, and the parents were nice, and or you were working with other musicians too. Like then it was the most fun job in the world, and so that's part of why I stayed so long, I think, and got kind of complacent there. Um, Because I was like, who wouldn't want to get paid a pretty good amount of money to, you know, sing the wheels on the bus to adorable kids. Um, But yeah, then at other times when you would go and it would become clear like five minutes in that they didn't really want to pay any attention to you, either the kids or the parents. And you had 40 more minutes of singing like old McDonald to go. <laughs> I I would just sort of sit there with my guitar and inside my head would be like, I have got to figure out another life plan. <laughs> like, what am I doing? <laughs> oh gosh. So, so, you know, it's, um, I remember watching, um, a, uh, children's uh, magician, this guy Danny Magic, and he had done mm-hmm. uh, he had done the birthday party circuit, you know, for, for our kids and their friends and stuff. Right. And I remember, like, like I I I, I do some stand up comedy, and and I know what I know what bombing looks like, and I know what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. And this poor guy was bombing in front of all these four year olds, and I like felt so bad for him. I I really did. I mean, I can only I can only imagine what that what bombing in front of all four year olds might feel like. That's exactly what it is. It is bombing and it feels terrible. You're like, I can't even keep these little kids into this song that was written expressly for them. And like the birthday boy is more interested in his little, like one time I did a birthday party and the little birthday boy didn't want to pay any attention to me. He only wanted to walk around and pretend to vacuum his apartment. (laughs) I was like, you'd rather vacuum than listen to me. That's right. Your vacuum doesn't even work. How dare you? <laughs> did they ever ask for covers? Like, did the kids request covers, like Freebird or anything like that? Or is it like... Oh, yeah. The kids always just Freebird. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes the kids were like, Frozen! Oh, um, oh God. <laughs> or sometimes the parents would request covers. There you go. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, I would get a little bit of advance notice. You know, they'd be like, oh, little Susie's favorite song is Peppa Pig. Can you learn the... Peppa Pig song. <laughs> well, I'm sure that chord arrangement is very complicated. Oh yeah! Wow, you would not believe it. <laughs> so you go, you go from doing that. So when when do you feel like like when do you feel like you can you can put down the guitar um, for the kids anyway and 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 kind of you know focus on the things that you really want to do. So when I sold Happy and You Know It in 2018, I believe. Um, I got really lucky. You know, my agent was wonderful and she got it into the hands of an editor who was really excited about it. And that editor wanted me to write another book too. So I got a two book deal. Um, and it was enough for me to pretty much entirely stop doing the kid's birthday party circuit. (laughs) You know, every once in a while I would do one, but yeah, since then I've been able to pretty much be a full-time writer. Although, yeah, it could always change. So please buy my book. <laughs> Let me keep doing it. I can't go back to the birthday parties. I know it's tough. It's tough. Um, but I mean, I think you need to have that, right? If you didn't have the birthday parties, you may not have gotten happy and you know it or, or the, the sort of, it may not have hit the way that it kind of did hit because there's probably so much truth in there. I think so too. Yeah. Now that I look back on it and I'm like, okay, I did. I am now able to do what I want to do. I am very grateful for those years. I don't know if you ever read a 
Cheryl Strayed at all. She wrote Wild and Tiny Beautiful Things. Mm -hmm. It's a collection of her advice columns that she wrote uh, called Dear Sugar. Um, and one woman wrote to her and was like, what would you tell, you know, yourself in your 20s? And she writes this gorgeous essay back, basically. Um, and she talks about, you know, all the long hours that you spend doing things that you feel like don't matter at the time. Yeah. And she says, those things are your becoming. And I think that's such a beautiful way of putting it. Like, children's birthday parties were my becoming. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. you, you need to have that. I mean, you, you need to have that struggle a little bit, I think, for to, to fuel those artistic <laughs> fires. If, if for no other reason than to really motivate you to, to want to make your living doing something else, right? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I think I wrote faster than I might have otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I want to talk about a special place for women, but before I do, I have to just say uh, self-care. Um, oh! I, I mean, I was watching that, and I'm like, first of all, the C word came out of nowhere for me. Like, I'm like, oh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a comedian at all? Yeah. I, well, huh, it's tough. I don't think of myself as a comedian primarily, yeah. for sure. But I do think I have a strong comedy background <laughs> or, you know, a comedy is a big part of what I do. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's nice. Like now that I have done these comedic music videos and I, you know, trained at some of the comedy theaters in New York, um, I can make my books funnier. Yeah. So I always feel really happy when people are like, Oh, obviously I loved the plot of your book and it was really juicy, but also, I was laughing out loud while I was reading it. Like, that's that's what I want. Yeah. I mean, I once had an editor tell me funny is money. So that's uh, that's probably a good thing. But nice. <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm watching and I'm listening to self-care. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I'm drawn to this because it's it's really smart and good writing, which it is. You know, lyrics are great and smart. Or if it's because it's just so damn true. Like, we, we all know, like, like, people, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. It's like. You know, you see so and so on Instagram or so and so on Facebook. Uh, I guess I date myself when I say Facebook, but you know, it's like, and it's like you know that this is not their life. You know, I know that this person is deeply unhappy. Yet everything you see about them, just you know, it's oh, the husband, have very happy with the husband and the kids are great and this and that. And I know deep down inside they're like, you know, it's not that right. But I think that's that's why it struck such a chord in me. I think is um, you know, because there's. That, that element of truth to it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think we all spend so much time, or maybe not all of us, but the majority of us spend so much time on these platforms. And it's it's really easy to feel bad about yourself when you're comparing yourself to the, you know, the other lives that you see, which of course have been carefully curated. Right. <laughs> um, and then I also wonder if it like lessens your own enjoyment of a thing when you put it online and you're like, oh, it didn't actually get as many people liking it as I thought it would. Did I not enjoy it as much <laughs> as yeah. I thought I did? Yeah. I mean, not to get too deep, but I think that's, you know, with, with mental health for, I mean, adults and kids, but with kids especially who can't really see the difference, I think, between, you know, what is like this, you know, almost hyperbolized version of, of their their peers and, and what's reality. It's, um, it's, uh, it's scary, but very funny when you do it. Very funny when you do it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's talk about uh, a special place for women because I, I love the concept of this book, and, and I'm just curious. Like, is I mean, I I get the sense of that I know a little bit of how happy and you know it, how that came to you because I mean, you were a children's musician, but how did this idea come to you? I mean, have you broken into a secret society of successful women before? Or? Yes, that was my other day job. Was <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I so a few years ago. A friend of mine who was a member of one of these women-only co-working spaces, uh, you know, one that wasn't, it wasn't secret, but it was exclusive and you certainly had to like apply to be a part of it. Um, and they didn't take everyone. There was a wait list. It was expensive. It was very beautiful. They had like a perfect Instagram, you know, um, and everybody always looked like they were having so much fun there as we previously discussed. So she invited me to have a coffee with her there as a guest for an afternoon. And I just remembered going and being so excited and being like, oh my God, I'm going to go into this utopia of women. Um, 
And then I got there and I just felt incredibly self-conscious the whole time, which some of it is, you know, my own neuroses for sure. But I was just like, oh, I'm not accomplished enough for these women. Um, like, I don't want to belong anyway. <laughs> um, and so I started thinking about what would happen if a woman who really did not consider herself a club person and did not think that she cared about those sorts of things uh, had to infiltrate a group of women like that, um, that, you know, amped up even more by making it secret and maybe more culty. Um, right. And yeah, what, what would happen? So what would happen? Well, I know you can't <laughs> tell us what would happen because that would, that would give away the plot of the book, but I mean, did, I know. What, what did you, what did you learn about yourself <laughs> as you were writing that? I mean, can, did you, any, any kind of insights come to you about, um, you know, your, your life or, or your place in this world as you're writing that book? Yeah. I mean, I think I learned that I really want to belong just like everybody else, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's not a surprise, but, uh, that I think it's a, def a defense mechanism oftentimes to be like, I don't care about this thing because it masks a, a fear that maybe you'll never get asked to be a part of it for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. and then one thing I learned while I was writing this book I, I kind of wanted to explore my own tendency to jump to judgment about something. Um, and like, why do I write certain things off? Um, or, you know, say that I, I don't think something is good, um, or smart or whatever. Like, and is there a better way to approach things? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit of the journey that the protagonist, this undercover journalist goes on over the course of the novel. Right, right. Well, I mean, it, it, it sounds fascinating and I can't wait to, I can't wait to dig in more to it. But, you know, Thanks. another thing I'm curious about is, I mean, this was part of it. It sounds like it was part of the second book in the two book deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that you had the deal and that the book was already sold, how did, how did that impact, if at all, your approach to writing it? I mean, did you feel like you had more freedom did you take more risks with, with the story or, or I'm just curious about that? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways, this it's a weird book. It gets very strange. <laughs> so I guess I did feel a certain sense of freedom of like, yeah, take it off the rails, <laughs> you know. Um, but I also think there was a certain amount of nervousness that came along with the freedom and along with the sense of security. Like I had never written a book on a deadline before. And when I got this two book deal, I didn't have a proposal for the next book, but I had a due date for it. And so uh, I basically had a year at a certain point where I was like, okay, got to figure out what I'm writing next and then write a full first draft of it. And I went through a few ideas before I landed on this one that were not good. And I remember just like, going to lunch with my agent and the team and, you know, pitching them like four ideas and then being sort of like, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, yeah. <laughs> to all of them. And so there were a few weeks in there where I just went on a lot of long walks and was like, I'll never write again. I'll have to give back the advance, you know? Right. <laughs> but once I got past that and once I found my idea and got into the meat of the story, then it was so nice to know that, I was going to have a supportive editor and a supportive agent who are really good at what they do um, to to read my work and make it better. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. Um, it's it's great that you have that kind of support system there, and and that you didn't have to pick up the the guitar and and play uh, Wheels on the Bus, you know, mm -hmm. again. Um, mm -hmm. Which, hey, whatever you want to do in your spare time is fine. I mean, if that's what if that's what you want to do. I mean, each of the wiggles are worth like $40 million each. So just let's not forget that. Oh, my God. I know. I actually used to work with and babysit for this woman, Lori Berkner, who's like oh, the new uh, Raffi. Oh, Lori Berkner. Under a shady tree, you and me. She was part of, um, oh, my God, Lori Berkner with the stockings. Um, I, I love Lori. I love relationship with her. Oh, I love really? Well, relationship with her. No, not, she's like, I don't she's know my personally. friend. So. No, no, I don't know. Her, not, not that I know her personally. I used to, I used to love the fact that my children would love. She was affiliated with this channel, Noggin, back in back yeah. in the day. Um, and I would love the fact that my kids would just be mesmerized by her. I would hate the fact 
that those songs were stuck in my head all day long. She was also part of this like Jack's Big Boot music show, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no, no. My kids were like right in her sweet spot because they were born in 02. And that's when I think she was starting to peak, as they say. But wow, I can't believe that you know Lori Berkner personally. Yeah, I love her. She's a wonderful, wonderful human. And I think she's so, so talented too. But you're right. Her songs are incredibly catchy, which is a blessing and a curse, I can imagine, for a parent. Yeah, yeah no, totally. But I mean, again, I, 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 my wife used to joke, she used to think that I wanted to be the fifth wiggle. Because oh. I, I got into such, I, I, I mean, I just wanted to know everything about these guys. Like, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I just needed to know, I just wanted to know if they were happy. Like, I wanted to know if they were happy human beings because, um, I don't know, it's like they, they wrote all these songs and it seems like they were having fun and their songs weren't terrible. Like, I could tell they were playing their instruments. And mm-hmm. then, I, then I, I, I went down this huge rabbit hole and I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So Anthony was in a band called The Cockroaches where he met Jeff Fat. And I'm like, oh my God, I know too much. I knew too much. And, and Greg, yeah. Yellow Shirt Greg loves Elvis, was in like an Elvis like tribute band. Like, yellow shirt Greg. <laughs> I shouldn't know any of this. But I do. Wow. But I do. Wow. Um, well, that's cool. So how did you get the Lori Berkner gig? I mean, what, what was that all about? Oh, so she wrote um, an original children's musical, and I auditioned for it, and I got the lead role, Wanda and Wanda's Monster. I played a five-year-old with a monster in her closet. Um, and... So we got to know each other through that. And I just, I thought her score for it was so good. And it was really wonderful. I mean, you know, we talked about the bad parts of the job, but the good parts of the job too. Like doing those shows for those kids, they were really moved by the show. And it like prompted some really good conversations, I think, for them. And they had like a really cathartic emotional experience watching the show. So it was a really magical time. I loved it. <laughs> That's cool. And it reminds me, I, yeah. I wrote a, a um, <laughs> the plot points of a story I wrote once featured a band called the Beagles, which was a kid's <laughs> band. And it was a, they did, it was a mashup of the Beatles and the Eagles. And, <laughs> and all of their song titles were like, like just like puns on Beatles and Eagles songs, but um, yes. that, that's the closest I ever got to entertaining kids was creating a character characters that were in a, uh, <laughs> a Beagles the Beagles. I like it. I would read but, about the Beagles. <laughs> yeah, you know what? And the guy actually wound up leaving the Beagles because he got a little he got a big head, and then he mm. um, you know then bad things happened because this was not a happy story. But, uh, <laughs> Well, fun, fun. So um, how's the book tour going? So I know this book is coming out next week. I mean, how do you find doing virtual book tours? Uh, you know, I what I like about it is that it probably does allow me to do more events and meet more people, which is great and be more easily accessible um, to a wider group of people. Like I remember for Happy New Know It, obviously I was so sad that my in-person book tour got canceled because of COVID. Um, but then at my launch event, we had a lot of people there from all over the country and from places that I was never going to actually go to on an in-person book tour. So it was great that they could see the event anyway. Um, But I am so eager for some in-person contact with people too. So I actually think, you know, it's nice this time. Everything is online pretty much. And I have have two big events coming up. um, My launch week, you know, my individual launch and then a, a talk with Emily Henry, the author of Beach Read and People We Meet on Vacation. And I'm really looking forward to both of those and they're virtual. Um, but then I think going to plan a couple little like very small distanced outdoor things for vaccinated people to be able to come to, um, mostly just friends and family. Um, so we can like wave at each other outdoors and celebrate. And I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, that'll be that'll good. Be that'll be good. Mm-hmm. I feel like, um, you know, since I... I, I got the vaccine a couple of weeks ago, I get my second dose. And it's like, I feel like yeah. it's like the world is kind of coming back. Like I just took somebody out to lunch today, which is something I haven't done in a while. And I'm like, Oh my God, it just felt so good to, to kind of have some, you know, sense of normalcy um, back. It's just, uh, I don't know. It's like, yeah. I feel, I feel like we're getting to a good, a good place now with it all. I think so too. I hope so. Yeah. No doubt, no doubt. So um, A Special Place for Women comes out next Tuesday. 
The 11th. Mm -hmm. Do I have that date correct? Yes, the um, 11th. Laura, where would you advise people to buy this book? Oh, well, I would say through your local independent bookstore would be my top recommendation because they are just heroes. And, uh, you know, what would we do without our independent bookstores? And what would authors do without independent bookstores to help discover and spread the word about their work? So I always love to recommend supporting them. Um, but, you know, it is available all over. You could do the Barnes & Noble route, the Amazon route. If you want to help support independent bookstores but don't particularly have a local store that you care about, um, you can order through bookshop.org or IndieBound. Um, yeah. Or, you know, a library is great, too. Like, obviously, I love when people buy my book, but I want people to read my book. <laughs> So, and libraries are wonderful. Even more important. But in addition to reading your book, they'll be able to watch this story at some point, won't they? <laughs> uh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. So to actually, you know, that's something that I, I didn't mean to, to kind of skip over. But, um, I mean, you're working with, with some people who've got some names in that, in that field. Who are, who are you working with to, to bring this to um, some kind of screen? Yeah, so I'm developing it, a special place for women for television. Uh, I get to adapt it, which is very exciting. Um, and Paramount Television Studios is the studio that's backing it. And Samantha B and her producing partner um, and their production company, Swimsuit Competition, are producing the project as well, which is really cool. <laughs> that's it's very cool. How did you hook up with, um, with Samantha B? So uh, I have an agent who specializes in film to TV uh, the, the film to TV pipeline. And so she is at a big agency and she has a lot of contacts. So she just kind of sent out the book to whoever she thought might be interested in a right fit for it. And we got some good responses and had some great conversations and ultimately went with this group of people. But, and they're all wonderful. So I'm excited about it. So, so your people your talk people to their talk people, people, basically. Yeah. And then I got on a Zoom and talked to them too. And Ooh. sometimes sometimes was charming, sometimes was awkward, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess, you know, you got to be careful when you meet uh, meet your heroes. Not that I want to accuse them of being your heroes, but I mean, <laughs> Samantha B is great. She's incredible. I was quite awkward on the Zoom with her because I was starstruck. So hopefully I get to talk to her again at some point soon and be like, no, I, I can carry on a conversation. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's funny. I've talked to a few authors whose work has been um, either gone to the big screen or, or to TV. And one of them was Tess Gerritsen, who wrote um, the Rizzoli and Isle series, which oh. – Became wildly, wildly successful. I mean, I mean wildly, wildly successful series of like twenty plus books, but also I think it did seven or eight seasons on TNT or USA or yeah. Um, you know, it and actually pretty pretty good show too. Um, I I do enjoy it, but I I was curious with her. I'm like, what was it like, kind of going from sort of the written you know written word to to seeing on screen? And she she wanted nothing to do with the sort of the screen adaptation, so she just basically kind of walked away and she was a consultant but she didn't really do anything with regards to producing or or you know writing scripts or anything like that and mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like you you want to be involved or you definitely are involved in sort of um kind of going from one to the other was that important for you to to, to have a close hand in it yeah i really wanted to you know i i'm trying to figure out how much i'm allowed to say <laughs> um but I had gotten previously some experience consulting and producing in a development project. Um, and that was really fun, but I was finding like, oh, I, I want to be able to adapt it to myself. And so then when it came time for us to send a special place of, for women around, um, my agent basically said like, Laura is very interested in adapting this one herself now that she's had some experience and, you know, she's like written a, a sample screenplay, here you go, if you want to read it and make sure she can write this way too. Um, and I think our our caveat was like, well, if somebody like really incredible wants to do it, but only if they can adapt it themselves. And, you know, it's like the biggest star writer, <laughs> Shonda Rhimes wants to, you know, adapt this series herself, will allow it. But <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> I I really wanted to be able to take a lead on it because I, I felt like I could do it and I, yeah. I wanted the chance. Yeah. And you know, both worlds too. I mean, you know what it's like as a performer 
but also mm-hmm. as a, as a creator. So I think that's some, that's some good connective tissue you have there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we talked, you know, we talked about kind of the, the early days. We talked about um, you being a children's musician and, and taking cover uh, requests. Um, we talked about my love of the wiggles. Uh, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> I brought that up. Uh, wow. And, it goes and deep. Your, <laughs> and your books. Did we miss anything? I mean, any other, anything else you want to share with uh, the fine uncorking story listeners? Oh my gosh. Um, well, you know, I hope that you'll all follow me on social media. I know we talked about how social media is evil, but I try to Oh, that, that's for other people. Not do for it. You. Yeah. I try to do a pretty good job of it. Um, so you can follow me on, you know, Instagram, I'm most active there or Twitter at Laura Hankin. <laughs> Add Laura and so both for Twitter and, and Instagram, same. Mm-hmm. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Um, yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to chat. This has uh, been fantastic and fun. Yeah, it was such a delight. I had a great time meeting you. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs>